In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You can be seated. So here's a question. Have you ever hurt someone? Have you ever insulted someone? Have you ever been the cause of someone's pain? My guess is, of course, the answer to all of those is yes. Here's the other side of that. Have you ever been hurt? Have you ever been insulted? Has a relationship you've been in ever been hurt by someone else's actions? And of course, my guess is the answer is yes to all of those as well. And even though all of these experiences are universal, the hard thing for us to figure out is what to do, how to be on the other side of these things. How do we react? How do we reconcile? How do we restore? How do we heal? How do we forgive? Let me give you an example of a time in my life that I think illustrates some of these situations. This story happened back when I was a university history professor. At this time, I'm a young professor. I'm trying to do all kinds of good things. I'm energetic. I still have energy. I don't know. Do you all remember that when you had energy? <laughs> so I have all this energy, and I want to get this new general education program implemented on the campus. And I've worked really hard with a lot of other folks to put in all these details for this new gen ed program, and we are super proud of our work. I mean, we've done a lot of good work. But here's the problem. There's this other group of faculty in this other part of the university who's proposed their own reorganized gen ed program. And our proposal is in competition with their proposal. And it's all coming down to a showdown. We're all going to have this big faculty vote about which plan the administration is going to implement. So I begin lobbying and politicking my way through the faculty, trying to line up votes ahead of time. And that might have been OK if as, as, if, as I did so, if as I did so, I simply let the arguments stick to the merits of my plan, the merits of the issue. But what I actually find myself doing over these several, way, several weeks is to denigrate the character of the people who support the other plan. And soon, we have a truly divided faculty at the university. The administration finally suggests that the leaders of the two plans try to work out some time of compromise before the vote. So I agree to meet with the head of the other faction. I'll call him James. I have all of my talking points ready. I'm prepared for blood. So we gather in this small room. The meeting lasts for a couple of hours. James talks. I talk. James talks again. But the truth is, neither one of us really listen. And between all of us here, I can tell you that my witty arguments and my not-so-hidden insults about James' intelligence are much, much more clever than anything that comes out of James's mouth at this thing. James just keeps on fumbling around the same few talking points about his plan, and I bring on this multi-pronged attack about his character, about his colleagues, about his so-called discipline, I feel much more prepared, and frankly, I feel triumphant, I feel cocky, and for James's part, I'm getting to him. He's starting to get angrier and angrier, and I start to think that steam is going to come out of his ears like in the cartoons, and he starts to fumble more, he starts to stumble over his words, and I'm just feeling more and more triumphant in this thing because I'm really kicking his butt. And finally, he gets to the point where he's just so mad he can't really say much, so I just stand up and turn out of the room feeling like I won the debate. About a week later, the faculty vote happens, and my proposal wins by a massive landslide. I mean, I won. Hoo-hoo! I won. But I got to tell you, 
a large group of the faculty on the quote unquote losing side of the argument, this is James's supporters, never really have anything to do with me ever again. In their eyes, I was forever branded at, at that university by my behavior during this episode. So here's a question for us again. When we find ourselves being perpetrators of such pain, when we break relationships, how do we begin healing? When we're on the receiving end of this type of insult, this type of injury, what do we do then? Perhaps we can find some inspiration in the continuing story of Joseph. In Genesis that we heard today, we pick up with Joseph's story. Several years have passed since Joseph's brothers have sold him into slavery. Joseph's life has undergone many twists and turns in Egypt, ultimately resulting in his life rising to a position of power, a position of great influence in Egypt under Pharaoh. But God, because God has instructed Joseph about the coming famine, Joseph is able to warn Pharaoh and save the empire from destruction. Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of all food distribution for those seeking help in the time of the famine. And as the story goes, because of this famine, Jacob, Joseph's father, sends his remaining sons to Egypt to obtain food, to sustain their suffering household. When these sons arrive, they come before Joseph, and they have no idea that this is their brother, their brother whom they had so deeply wronged all those many years ago. Joseph, on the other hand, Joseph recognizes them right away. And to keep up the disguise, Joseph first speaks through an interpreter, and there's a lot of back and forth. We have a few chapters describing all the back and forth, coming back and forth between the, the lands. And the brothers are rightfully intimidated by this powerful, quote-unquote, Egyptian administrator. But at the point where our reading picks up today, Joseph cannot contain his emotions anymore. Joseph clears all the Egyptians out of the room, and then in a scene where I imagine these brothers are equally nervous and curious and terrified, they wonder what's about to happen. Joseph then speaks for himself, and he, he speaks to them directly in Hebrew to the brothers, and he tells them he is Joseph. He is the one they sold into slavery all those years ago. The emotions of this moment are so strong, so wrought, that scripture tells us Joseph wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it. The entire household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph immediately asks whether his father Jacob is alive, and the brothers, the brothers are so shocked by this revelation, this, this moment, this situation, they cannot even speak. Their actions all those years ago had been horrible. Out of their jealousy, out of their contempt, out of their pettiness, they had brutally and physically handed over their own brother into slavery. And now, and now their own brother is there in front of them, the one they had so wronged. So where is this scene going is this the time for Joseph's awesome revenge? Is he going to now order the Egyptian soldiers to torture and kill these brothers to get back at them? I mean, that's what Hollywood would do, right? This would be the time. No. Joseph forgives them. This is so hard to believe. He forgives them? That doesn't seem right. How could this be after all they put him through? You see, forgiveness is tough. Forgiveness takes work. Forgiveness takes courage. Forgiveness is a hard choice. The late Archbishop Desmond Tutu talked and wrote a lot about forgiveness. After personally being tortured and imprisoned in apartheid South Africa, Archbishop Tutu 
helped lead the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when apartheid came to an end. From this experience, Archbishop Tutu talks about the fourfold path for healing. It's not an easy path to forgive. He says, on this path, we must walk through the muddy shoals of hatred and anger and make our way through grief and loss to find the accept that acceptance is the hallmark of forgiveness. So how can we forgive? Archbishop Tutu says that the four-step process begins first with telling the story. Tell the story of the broken relationship. Tell the story of the broken promise. Tell the story of the brokenness. This is what Joseph did. He tells his brothers, I am Joseph. I am the one that you sold into slavery. The second step, the second step is to specifically name the hurt. Name the hurt. Joseph does this as well. Joseph weeps loudly, so loudly that his emotion, his weeping is heard far off. The third step is to grant forgiveness. Joseph extends all the hospitality he can to his brothers. You see, in the end, forgiveness is not really for the perpetrator. Forgiveness is how we find freedom from our stories of victimhood. It's how we chart our own paths forward. Archbishop Tutu says we transform ourselves from victim to hero with the act of forgiveness. And finally, the fourth step is once we've granted forgiveness, that's when we decide, we decide the status of relationship. With forgiveness, we can come to reconciliation. We can come to reconciliation, but as Tutu points out, if having relationship with the person who hurt you is unsafe, too painful, or puts other people in your life in danger, it's likely that releasing the relationship is the best choice. Releasing the relationship may be the best choice. In other words, reconciliation is not always the end goal in every situation. Joseph chooses reconciliation. Although his story of harm by his brothers is severe, it is his story. It's his story to tell. He finds healing in Egypt. He knows the presence of God. He takes control of his hurt, his pain, his suffering, and now he forgives and he seeks reconciliation with his family. A couple of years after that vote on my plan at the university, I'm sitting in my office grading papers. I hear a knock at my door and I look up and James is there. I haven't spoken a single word to him in about two years and his faction of the faculty have been actively shunning me for that entire time. I invite him in and I feel my heart racing. I'm nervous. I feel guilty about the things that I said to him those two years ago. And I know I should apologize, but I have to admit my mind is also racing trying to think about potential insults that I'm going to give him if he's actually here to start it up again. You know, how you do that thing. I'm, I'm guarding myself, just trying to be ready for whatever this, this thing is. Robert, he says, I just want to clear the air with you. I just keep thinking about that day of our meeting. I had no right to be angry with you. You were just being passionate about a very good plan for our students. And I just want to let you know that I'm telling anybody who asks, we're good. What? What? I'm just floored that he's sitting here saying this. That he's apologizing to me? This makes no sense. I mean, yes, he got angry, but I was pretty horrible to him. 
and I've been avoiding him, and then I realize he's forgiving me. We talk for a little while. I apologize for my behavior. We hash things out. He leaves. And I have to tell you, we never really become close, but we certainly become cordial and collegial in our relationship after that. But I am changed by this. I pay closer attention to my role in relationships, in conflicts, in hurts and pains and problems. I am inspired by James's courage and vulnerability and forgiveness. I'm inspired by Joseph's courage and vulnerability and forgiveness. May we all continue to work at God's dream of hope and healing in this world. And when necessary, may God grant us the courage to walk that muddy, rugged, difficult path of forgiveness. Amen.